Well, I'll hand over to you, Chris, and let you introduce yourself. And yeah, I'll interject as we get some questions coming in later on. Okay, well, uh, um, good morning or good afternoon, depending upon where you are. Um, what I'm going to try and cover in the next uh, 40 minutes or so is issues around pre-emergent herbicides focused on southern systems. So we'll talk about how to get the best out of pre-emergent herbicides for ryegrass. Um, I'll cover off on things to think about if it gets dry. Um, and so you want to go dry sowing and how do you play your pre-emergent herbicides in that circumstance. Talk a bit about brome grass and about um, why brome grass is so much harder to uh, get control of with pre-emergent herbicides, what your herbicides might be doing for brome grass and perhaps uh, some ways to think about how to actually manage brome grass better. And I'm going to finish off talking about the current resistance status we've got two pre-emergent herbicides and a few ideas about how to think about how to play these given resistance is turning up. So that's what we're going to try and cover. Um, so I want to start off and just talk about, you know, the issues that we need to consider with pre-emergent herbicides. Um, for those who listened to uh, Mark Congreve's uh, webinar a couple of days ago, much of this is going to be the same, but I think that we do need to be thinking about these things. So the first one you need to worry about is your soil type the amount of organic matter you've got uh, because that will influence how your herbicides behave, how far they move in the soil. You need to worry about the amount of rainfall you've had prior to sowing. So, you know, it's dry at the moment, but you might have had a few millimetres of rain. How does that do things? Most importantly here in the south, we really need to worry about the amount of rainfall we're going to get in the 10 days after sowing. Um, that becomes really quite important in terms of getting the best use out of our pre-emergent herbicides. We need to worry about stubble, how much is there, um, where it is. So is it standing? Is it on the ground? And one of the things that does really influence our thinking about pre-emergent herbicides, um, particularly for ryegrass control in cereals where we don't have any post-emergent options, is the persistence of the herbicide we've got and we've got to try and match that to the growing season. So they're all things that I'm going to um, talk about as I go along in the in the ryegrass um, uh, space. So they're the issues. Um, I'm actually going to talk about the specific pre-emergent herbicides in a few minutes and I'll show you some data about some ways to play them later on. Um, but first of all I want to look at how do we get the most out of our pre-emergent herbicides for ryegrass? So I, they're the issues. Here's some very much some specifics for ryegrass. And, and probably the one of most note beginning is that if we've got light soils with low organic matter, that's where we're most likely to get crop damage with pre-emergent herbicides. And this is because they just don't hold up the herbicides from moving down the profile. So they might all go down immediately. Um, some of these herbicides that I talk about have got a tendency to keep moving down that profile every time it rains. So those are the soils where you're most likely to get crop damage. They're the soil types where you have to be most careful about placement of your herbicides and also the choices in uh, herbicides you're using. So you might hear of people who have um, used herbicide, these herbicides in other situations and they've been fine and you get crop damage. It can actually come down to soil type. Uh, the more water soluble herbicides will move readily through the soil profile. The ones that are less soluble won't. So if we want to protect our crop from damage, we need these less soluble products. If we want to get weeds that are below the soil surface, we need the more soluble products. So we have a bit of a conundrum there. Most of the pre-emergent herbicides that we have need to be at the level of the weed seed or below it. There's no point them sitting on the surface if the seeds are below the surface germinating because they won't do their job. Uh, Avidex Extra is probably the one exception to that where we actually want it to have sitting at the seed or above the seed. All the others we want at or below the seed. That means we need a little bit of moisture just to move those down through the profile. And it's why for many of these products, uh, no-till systems really work. High crop residue loads on the surface will reduce efficacy and they do that two ways. Um, with trifluralin, they actually tie up the herbicide so it's unavailable. For most of the other herbicides we're talking 
they do is they just reduce the ability of that herbicide to get to the surface and get below the seed. So a rule of thumb that we use in the south about um, stubble is that if you can go out in the paddock and you can see in any area, you know, near area where you're going to be spraying that the stubble covers 50% of the soil surface or less, you'll get pre-emergent herbicides to work. If it's more than 50% of the soil surface, you're going to struggle to get pre-emergent herbicides to work. And in some cases, you just got to get rid of that stubble. Uh, I think last year was a, a particularly good example of that in um, the south and the east where we had uh, very high stubble loads from the previous season. And I had a number of calls from farmers and consultants who'd um, gone out to go seeding and found that they couldn't get their seeded through the stubble and had to burn the stubble. And then they wanted to know if their pre-emergent herbicide was still there. The answer is no, if you've burnt the stubble, you've lost the herbicide. So, you know, if in doubt, do burn the stubble first if you, if you have to, to get these herbicides to work. The, probably the big key this time of the year when thinking about these herbicides, particularly as we're in a particularly a dry period at the moment is that moisture is required for activity. Different amounts of moisture for different herbicides. I'll cover that off in a minute. But if it's the herbicides are put out and it remains dry, it's unlikely they're going to do very much. And separation of the product from the crop seed is essential for most of the products that we have for at least one crop we're using them in. So we get crop safety by that separation. And this means that you do need to be careful of situations where that herbicide will get down into the furrow or down to the roots of your crop. So shallow sowing of crops can be a problem. Heavy rainfall can be a problem. Okay, talking about the various herbicides we've got. I've actually got some, some numbers here so that you can see how the herbicides sort of play out. What I've got is I've got on the on the uh, left hand side there is the, the herbicide uh, chemical name. Um, you'll mostly know them by their trade name. So I've got some example trade names. And the next column after that's the solubility. That's in, in milligrams per litre. And I don't think we need to worry about what the actual solubility is very much for here. What I want you to do is to look at and see that these are really falling into about three or four main groups. So up the top, we've got uh, dual gold and butazan, and they've got high solubility, over 400 milligrams per litre. So they're very soluble products. They'll move a lot in the soil. Uh, then we have atrazine, which is 35. So it's a lot less soluble, but it does, uh, it does move quite readily. And then most of the herbicides we're using is pre-emergent herbicides for ryegrass control in cereals. Uh, are not very soluble at all. And we have this group that's in that sort of, you know, 13 to, to 4 range, that the um, Arcade, Edge, uh, Simazine, Avidex, and Sakura, uh, that have a little bit of water solubility, but not huge amounts of it. And then down the bottom, we've got products that are pretty much, for all intents and purposes, insoluble in water. So, what we expect is if we get rainfall is that the ones at the bottom aren't going to move very far, the ones at the top will move a long way. So if we've got weed seeds below the surface, we've got the potential to control those with things like butazan or with dual gold or box of gold that have the uh, metolachlor component. Um, our ability to control those with things like Sakura or trifluralin is very limited. The column on the next slide uh, and the end of this slide is talking about binding to organic matter. Now, there's a number of ways that herbicides bind to soils, um, and I might talk a bit about a few of those as we go along, particularly if there are some questions about that. But organic matter is probably the key component. And, of course, these don't match solubility at all. So one of the immediate things to to see is that these are all over the place compared to solubility. For most of the products, there's not that much binding to organic matter. Um, so the numbers are mostly, you know, below two or 300 um, in this scale. There's a few that are larger. Um, and then there's trifluralin. Maybe we might start with trifluralin as 
being right down the bottom. So you can see that that's almost 16,000. And what that tells me is that when this meets, when trifluorin meets organic matter, it just binds to organic matter and it really doesn't come off until that organic matter is broken down. So trifluorin bound organic matter is, for all intents and purposes, unavailable. So one of the reasons why we've had to increase our trifluorin rates for no-till seeding is that we're keeping a lot more organic matter in the form of stubble and crop residue sitting on the surface. And all the trifluorin that gets bound of that is unavailable. Uh, we know from our pot testing work that you actually only need half a litre of trifluorin to kill ryegrass, but we're putting out two and a half litres or up to two and a half litres. That's because a lot of that extra trifluorin isn't actually going towards killing the ryegrass. It's being bound on organic matter or we're losing it in other ways. What this means is that in soils with reasonable amounts of organic matter, trifluorin with low water solubility, high binding to organic matter is not gonna go very far. So if you get heavy rainfall on it, it's pretty much gonna stay mostly where it is. There are some caveats about that. I'm gonna come back and talk about them in a, in a few minutes. If we look at some of the other herbicides that we're dealing with, um, <clears throat> some that you're very familiar with. So, I mean, trifluorin you'll be familiar with, um, but if we start looking at say, simazine and atrazine, we see that um, they have relatively low water solubility, simazine less than atrazine, but they also have relatively low binding to organic matter. That means that for atrazine, which is slightly more soluble, when it rains, that's gonna move down the profile and it's not really gonna get tied up very much. So when it rains again, it's gonna move down the profile some more. And when it rains again, it'll move further down the profile. So atrazine is gonna move a lot more than simazine solely based on its solubility, not based on its ability to bind to organic matter because neither of them do. Uh, Prosulfur carb, which is in box gold or arcade, we start looking at that one, that's gonna bind a lot more tightly to organic matter. So whilst it's got, say, more solubility than, than simazine, for example, and you might expect it to move further in the profile, it will initially, but then it's gonna get tied up on the organic matter. So it's actually not gonna move very far, very quickly. So when we have a discussion about, perhaps we're gonna use some of these products as post-emergent options, and people are going to me and going, well, can we use RK post-emergent? My answer is mostly no, you shouldn't use RK. You should use Box of Gold because Box of Gold contains that s component. And you can see that s is, first of all, a lot more water soluble. And secondly, doesn't bind to organic matter as much. So it's gonna move further. So if you've separated your weed seeds from your herbicide and then try to want to get them with that herbicide, you need something that's going to get there. And Arcade is probably not the product for that. Uh, looking at um, a couple of other products here that I can really talk about together because they behave quite similarly, and that's um, Sakura and uh, Propizamide. Um, one we use in cereals, one we'll use in, in canola. They've got relatively low water solubility, uh, and they don't have a lot of um, binding to organic matter, though propizamite has more than Sakura, and that actually influences how it behaves. Um, what we know about those products is they need quite a lot of rain to activate. So we'd be typically talking 10 to 15 millimetres of rain in that 10 days after sowing to activate those. And if you don't get that rainfall, then they really won't do a very good job. With um, Sakura, because it's got that lower binding to organic matter, if you keep getting rainfall, that's gonna keep moving down the profile. So in some circumstances with Sakura, if we've had that dry period up the front and then it does rain, we actually can see that Sakura will pull back those weeds a little bit. Um, won't kill them, but it'll stop them being quite as competitive. We don't tend to see that with propizamide because it tends to not move as much because it's um, bound by that organic matter. A couple of other um, products that perhaps surprise you a little bit. Um, you know, most people don't think that um, Avidex Extra is actually very water soluble, and, but in fact, it's more water soluble than Sakura. 
Uh, and one of the things we see with um, with Avidex is that it's got a, a better opportunity of getting into the crop row than trifluralin does. Uh, and so often we'll see that trifluralin and Avidex mixtures work quite well because you get some of that ryegrass that's in the row. Um, the second last one on this list um, is uh, terrain. Now, we really wouldn't consider this to be a grass herbicide. It's more a broadleaf herbicide. We now have a registration for terrain for both cereals and fava beans. Um, the cereal rate's not going to do very much around grasses. Consider that entirely a broadleaf uh, herbicide. But in the pulse crops, the rate is higher, and that will do a little bit for ryegrass control. And if you couple that with another pre-emergent herbicide, you might find that you get quite effective um, ryegrass control in some circumstances. Now, terrain, low water solubility, so it's not going to move very far. Um, reasonable binding to organic matter, it's going to sit really on the surface. And what it'll do is it'll stop those weeds from coming through that surface. Of course, putting it out in front of a knife point press wheel system, you'll have nothing in your crop row. It's not going to get into the crop row. It's not going to provide any control there. So if you're looking to match it with something, you're probably looking to go for something that might have a little bit of uh, uh, water solubility, but probably not too much because most of our pre-emergent herbicides do tend to be a bit damaging to beans if they can get where your uh, the roots of your crop are. So just matching it with the appropriate um, herbicide that's perhaps got a little bit of mobility would be the way to play that one. Last herbicide, and one I really haven't talked much about except right at the beginning, is butazan. Uh, butazan is registered for canola, for ryegrass. Uh, the issues we really have with butazan is that it's got high water solubility, low binding to organic matter. Um, this means its place is probably going to be strongest where you've got uh, lower rainfall situations, so in the low to medium rainfall zones. Once you get into the high rainfall zones, it's going to come under a bit of pressure. Uh, particularly if you get a lot of water, because it's going to move through that profile pretty quickly. And we might end up actually pushing that out of the uh, uh, root zone of the of the weeds. So that's another herbicide where in some situations you might need to try and um, bolster its activity. So thinking overall about these various products, we can probably come up with some sort of rules about how we might think about using these herbicides in different situations to their um, greatest potential. So in really dry situations, some of these herbicides that have got lower water solubility might be might struggle a bit um, and maybe the, might match those up with some herbicides with um, high water solubility. In high rainfall situations, um, dry seeding, you probably want to go back to those herbicides with low water solubility. There was one last thing I want. Oh yes, the last thing I wanted to talk about this is that what I've talked at the moment has really been about herbicides that are going to behave and be taken up in the um, soil water fraction. That's how most of these herbicides are going to be taken up. There is one major exception to that, and that's trifluralin. Trifluralin is very much a special case. What happens with trifluralin is it doesn't get dissolved in water because it's virtually insoluble. But when it does meet water, it turns into a gas and it gets taken up as a gas. This is fine if you've got it incorporated in the soil and it's why it, above all these other herbicides, really requires soil incorporation to work because it'll get trapped in that soil layer and then that's the opportunity for the germinating seedlings to take it up. If you put it out on the surface and don't incorporate it and you get rainfall, then you're gonna lose a lot of that herbicide. And so incorporation is really key um, with, uh, with trifluralin. Uh, if you read the Avidex Extra label, it'll say incorporate within a few hours. You don't need to be nearly as um, finicky about the incorporation of, of Avidex Extra. Um, you won't lose nearly as much as you will trifluralin. You'll lose some, but not nearly as much. And for the other herbicides, you're not going to use, lose very much if you don't incorporate them immediately. Uh, the other ones where there is incorporation requirements are um, largely around them trying to stop them moving off site 
uh, with water movement. And of course, you don't want them moving off site with water movement because then they're not there to kill, control your weeds. So that's around the behaviour of the, of the herbicides. Um, the other bit that I haven't spoken about is about persistence of these herbicides. And um, that can be a problem because if we end up in situations, and this is a photograph of a, a crop that had been um, treated with box of gold, which has relatively low persistence, and it had run out of activity, and you've got a whole bunch of weeds coming up in the crop. So of the various herbicides that we're talking about, really the ones with lowest persistence are going to be your uh, esmetolichlor and butazan. Um, they tend to have the lowest persistence. Most of the others sort of have um, medium to long persistence. Uh, in some cases, that persistence can be a problem. For example, with Sakura, um, in terms of planting oats after using it. But for most of these herbicides, we don't get a lot of plant back issues most years. They're not really the ones we're worrying about for plant packs. So. What that boils down to is that in higher rainfall zones where you're going to have extended germination of ryegrass, you need to have in there some herbicides with longer persistence. So you're looking at primarily amongst the various uh, options that have got a, we've got available, trifluralin, Sakura as being the, the main ones that you're going to um, put up front um, to get that persistence and the shorter persistent herbicides uh, you'll need to have some other controls in place to get the um, life you want out of those. So, Chris, I might, uh, might pull you up there and we, yep. I think we've got a few um, questions coming through. Oh, we haven't, sorry, I'm having a few technical difficulties of my own. Lisa's going to let me know when there's questions coming through. But a um, couple of things. One, I've heard you talk a bit before about, uh, yeah, for example, Sakura needs that 10 or 15 mils of rainfall to fire it up. Um, what uh, what about the other herbicides? Are some of the other ones that are slightly less soluble, is it? do they need sort of 20 or 30 mils of, herbicide, of rainfall to fire them up? Or is, it, is most of them in that sort of 10, 15, 20 mils of rainfall all you need? Uh, yeah, look, most of them to, to get them moving, you're, you're you know, probably in that 10 millimetres is what you're looking for in 10 days after application. Um, Flumioxazin, you know, because it's got such low solubility, the, um, uh, you know, label recommends a little bit more than that. Um, but I think with Flumioxazin, we're really playing the long game there rather than necessarily trying to get um, control of ryegrass, all of our ryegrass uh, immediately. Um, so what we're looking for that to do is actually give us um, some good residual control in the in the season and why I think we really need to be looking to partner that with a another pre-emergent herbicide that's going to do some of that early work for us. Uh, so Sakura, we're looking, as I said, 10 to 15 millimetres. Um, you know, things like um, uh, propizamide tends to run about right. Uh, box of gold, we can perhaps get a little bit uh, underway with a little bit less than 10. Um, and the same's true of, uh, of butazan. So, yeah, you know, so I, ten's probably a good, a good, you know, rule of thumb of where most of them are. A little bit more with the ones, you know, Sakura and terrain. Um, Trifluralin, as I said, because it behaves differently and as a gas, the amount of rainfall you need for activation is actually much less. And I'm actually going to so talk about that when we're, I uh, dry seeding. Oh, okay. Well, I was about to ask you a question about that, so I'll leave that. But I guess the other question is, uh, what about if we do get some moisture and we've, we're have we wet sowing, but we've put the herbicide down after the rainfall and then we seed, uh, and then obviously it's best if we get a drop of rain on top to fire up all of the herbicides. But in that situation, is it fair to say that things like trifluralin and box of gold are a little bit better than, say, uh, Sakura? Oh, I think the it's probably fair to say that if you've if you've had a been moist and you put your products out and then it comes in dry that you'll get a lot more activity out of trifluralin than you probably will for any of the other products here. Uh, yeah. The box of gold is probably your next best bet, and Sakura will struggle under those circumstances. But I'll so cover I guess that with one. all of this, um, really the message is we just need to be flexible. I think we 
we often have that thing where we might have done a paddock plan um, with an agronomist, uh, you know, in March or something, and then based on uh, what we've got in front of us now, we really need to be flexible and, and react to the conditions in front of us rather than necessarily following the recipe that we, that we wrote down a couple of months ago. Well, I think that yeah, that that's certainly true, but um, but there's also the option of you know sort of rethinking your order of paddock sowing. If you've got yeah. a you know if you've got a paddock where you really want to put the cura out and the conditions are a little averse to that, um, you know should you just wait a little and uh, particularly mm. if there's some rain coming, and uh, and then just sow that one immediately in front of that rain, as opposed to sowing it you know sort of ten days out from that rain. It's a bit hard yeah. to predict when we're going to get rain, but we kind of get a feel for when the systems are coming across and maybe just waiting a few days to sow a paddock and, and sow something else instead where you've got a, uh, a plan that's got a different herbicide mix. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, well, I'll get out of the way and let you keep going. Chris, get your questions coming in, everyone. If you have some questions, we'll pause again in a few moments to answer those. Yeah, so I just want to um, just briefly talk about the the issues in the in the highest rainfall zones, and these really are issues for the highest rainfall zones. Before I come back to the lower rainfall zones, so one of the things with this problem of persistence is that we actually did some work a number of years ago where we did a range of um, trials where we looked at how do some of these herbicides really perform in those high rainfall zones, and this is the result of the trial. I'm going to take this complicated um, uh, figure, but I'll take you through it because I'm going to show another one of these when I talk about brown grass. Um, so this is reduction in the amount of ryegrass we've got, and we actually measure our ryegrass at the end of the season, um, with a range of different herbicide options, and these are what are known as box and whiskers plots. And the important bit is you've got that box there. That line in the middle of the box is the average. So this is across six trials, and that's the average for those trials. The, um, the whiskers, the bits on the end, that's the best and worst of the trial. So I think the first take home message is that in fact, all of these herbicides can perform pretty well given the right conditions. Uh, but some of the herbicides, so if you look at the top there, they're all you know giving us their best option, giving us either 90 or more percent control. But under adverse conditions, so looking at the bottom, we can actually have some real problems. Now, the tri these trials were done in, in South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales, and all of the South Australian sites were affected by trifluorin-resistant ryegrass. Um, so trifluorin has been adversely affected here by res resistance. But, but even so, we know under adverse conditions that it can struggle. Um, you know, you can see with Avidex and Box Gold, we can be as low as 50% control if we get adverse conditions. In this case, that was too much rain. Even with Sakura, it can be down as low as 60%. So when we're getting into these really high rainfall areas where we need that long, long persistence, we need to be doing some other things. Just putting a single herbicide out and going, that's going to do the job for us is probably not the approach we should be taking. We should be looking at other strategies. Uh, one of the things that we've done is to add Avidex Extra to that, and you can immediately see that when we have Trifluorin plus Avidex Extra, even though we got resistance, we've immediately lifted the average level of control from about 45% to almost 80. Um, but we've even lifted most of those trials except the worst one. Uh, and if we didn't have trifluorin resistance, that would actually have been a pretty tight set of um, bars there. Um, but it's helped with Box of Gold and it's helped with Sakura as well. So that'd be our first line would be to say, well, we add Avidex Extra to um, Sakura or to trifluorin. That'll help us in those low long season situations. The other one, and we were doing this work originally uh, in terms of getting a, a registration for Box of Gold post-emergent, and what that shows is that if we use, say, trifluorin up front and come back with Box of Gold post-emergent, despite resistance to trifluorin, we've tightened those bars up into a very, very acceptable band. Um, it's even better with Sakura because we don't have that influence of uh, trifluorin resistance affecting us. So high rainfall, if you're relying on pre-emergent herbicides, you need more pre-emergent herbicides to make it work because you're not going to get enough out of any single product to get you through the season. Of course, so we go Chris, to low... Uh, well, just, uh, we just had a question come in yep. uh, and it's one that I talk about a fair bit as well. And the question was, should we stack 
uh, modes of action or rotate them. Uh, and my answer is I think we should do both, which is mix and rotate. Can we mix two herbicides this year and mix a different two herbicides next year? Um, do you agree with that or are there exceptions to that rule? I think that there, there's always exceptions to rules like that, but I want to talk about that when I get to the end of this, the uh, webinar. I've got a little right slide on that, on some thinking about how we might play pre-emergent herbicides and that comes into that. Okay, so we'll leave that for now. Just the other question that sprung to mind for me, the other mix we see promoted a lot is uh, Scura plus trifluralin. Uh, it's not in this trial, is that because there was quite a bit of trifluralin resistance in that area? Yeah, so trifluralin, I think trifluralin plus um, Sakura is a, is a good mix for uh, difficult moisture situations as opposed mm. to necessarily for long season situations. Um, right. So I, I think it's actually that, you know, when you get into those, um, those uh, you, you know, you're, gonna have, you know, you're in an area where you generally have a reasonable season, but it's a bit, um, it can be a bit dry and patchy up front. Um, mm. Particularly if you've got moisture below, then trifluralin sakura becomes an ideal product for that. We didn't have it here because we knew we were going to have some trifluralin resistance and we were looking at um, other strategies around that. But certainly that's Fair another enough. mixture that could come into play. Yep. Um, Thanks, Chris. The other, I'll uh, the other, let you keep going. All right. The other thing, you know, the other component to um, um, pre-emergent herbicides is crop competition. And these are some uh, couple of photographs from trials that uh, we've been running looking at um, time of sowing with wheat and crop competition. And I'm not going to show data. I'm only going to show the photographs just to show the, the value of that crop competition in helping your pre-emergent herbicides to work. So remembering our pre-emergent herbicides are working for those first few weeks of the season and then we've got nothing for ryegrass until we come right at the back end of the season where we might come in with some um, harvest weed seed control tactics. Uh, crop competition can be the thing that actually gets us through that middle. So these crops were sown uh, a month apart. So time of sowing one was the beginning of May, time of sowing two was the beginning of June and just the difference. They've got the same amount of ryegrass in them, but because we've been able to hold back the ryegrass with the pre-emergent herbicides and allow the crop to grow over it, you can't see the ryegrass with time of sowing one. With time of sowing two, there's all that ryegrass in the crop. So crop competition plus pre-emergent herbicides is the way that you should be thinking about how you're using the pre-emergent herbicides. And that, of course, means that when you come into the pulses where we don't have crop competition to help us, we need to be having other tactics in that middle space. And that means that pre-emergent herbicides, you're probably going to be looking at following those up with your clethodim uh, or clethodim plus factor mixes to make that work. So crop competition is something that we should be thinking of doing every time we're relying on pre-emergent herbicides to do our weed control for us. Okay, dry seeding. You want to go dry seeding? What pre-emergent herbicide should you use? Well, first of all, select a more persistent product if you're going to go dry seeding because you're going to need that product to survive that first lot of rainfall and then to continue to work through the season. So trifluralin, apizomide or Sakura are probably better options than choosing Box of Gold or Butazan. Uh, you need to understand where your moisture is. Um, so often I get the question, oh, I want to go dry seeding, what should I use? And my immediate question back is, well, how dry is dry? Is it dry on the surface and wet underneath, or is it dry down through the profile? If it's dry down through the profile, then you don't actually even have to worry too much about what the herbicides are going to do. You put the herbicides out, they're going to stay there until it rains. If it's moist underneath, then you can have things happen, and this is the question that, uh, that Peter was asking. So if it's dry on the surface, but it's moist underneath, and it's going to be dry, Sakura is not your best choice. Uh, in fact, trifluralin is the best choice if you don't have any resistance. And that's about the specific behaviour of trifluralin. It doesn't need a lot of moisture to activate because as soon as it meets moisture, it turns into that gas. So it's the one that probably activates with the lowest amount of moisture, even though it's not water soluble. After that, they all activate based largely on their water solubility. So Sakura, low water solubility, it's not a, bit, a good choice. Same reason simazine wouldn't be a good choice in some of these sort of circumstances. You need rainfall afterwards to get it to activate. Less so for box of gold um, or, or butazam, for example. 
Now, there's a little bit of a um, caveat on this, is that it all depends a bit on what the surface looks like when you put the product out. So if you, you do need to understand what dry looks like and what dry and wet underneath looks like. So dry on the surface, we're talking about the top few millimetres of the surface being dry, but there being moisture below that. If that moisture is still getting up to the surface, it'll activate these herbicides. So if at night you're getting dews and that moisture's coming up, you'll actually get some activation. So if you have a lot of moisture there, you can get these herbicides to activate. So last season, for example, we had 70 millimetres of rain come through in a, a storm um, late April. Anybody who got to cure out immediately, it worked. The people who waited a couple of weeks got into, or even 10 days, got into that May period when it started to dry, and then it didn't rain again till July, Takura didn't work for them. So even though we didn't get rain, specifically get rain after that um, uh, sowing, because there was so much moisture there at sowing, that worked. But for general rules, if it's dry down on the surface and it's going to remain dry, you want something with more water soluble than, solubility than Sakura. Uh, dry seeding, so if it's dry, dry, so dry down through the profile, be really careful on light soils uh, because the herbicides will move more if you get high rainfall as your first rainfall event, and that includes trifluridin. So normally we don't worry about trifluridin moving very much, even with high rainfall events, but if you get that first rainfall event after sowing and the surface has been dry and it's, say, 20 or 30 millimetres or more, you can expect that trifluorin will move. It might wash with particles into your furrow, but it might actually just move with that waterfront down below the soil. So that's where we get crop damage with dry sowing is where we've used, and it doesn't matter which herbicide we've used, they'll all move with that water because they haven't had time to bind to the soil components. Um, consider mixtures Good in this today. To hedge your pets? Yes, better. Uh, just uh, a couple of questions. Um, firstly, just on persistence, uh, some of the data I saw from Wantfer and WA was that trofluralin persisted the least, then Boxer Gold a bit more, then um, Sakura a bit longer. Um, but I'm just wondering, is that a soil type dependent thing? I've also heard uh, from people in the east on the heavier soils that trofluralin does persist quite a bit longer. And so you've got trifluralin uh, up there is persisting a bit longer than say a box of gold. Um, do you think that's a soil type dependent thing? Oh, look, I think there may be a range of things, Peter, that are actually happening in the environment um, that mean that you're not seeing the efficacy of that persistence. So, mm. um, you know, one of which might be that on soils where a lot of trifluralin has been used, it's almost certainly a little bit, and that might vary from a little bit to quite a lot of increased breakdown of the herbicide by microbes. In fact, trifluralin, yeah. even in the east, doesn't persist the way it used to persist. Um, but you've also got the potential for that, you know, what growers perceive as persistence is actually, is it controlling my weeds? as opposed to, is the herbicide still there? So it might be there, but if it's not actually where the weeds are, then it won't be controlling them um, or won't be controlling them as well. Or if you've got resistance, then you won't see it um, nominally persisting yeah. quite as well. So there's a whole range of things that could come into that observation. Um, but soil type's one of the things that does influence the way these herbicides behave. And there yeah. might certainly be true on those really lighter soils that maybe the trifluralin has gone somewhere where the weeds aren't. Okay, thanks, Chris. And one other question came through from our listeners, um, just it was, I think it was specific to your previous um, trial with the box and whisker plot where there was Avidex mixed with uh, Sakura. Can you remember the rate of Avidex there? Yeah, so that, those trials were all done with 2.2 um, uh, litres of, of Avidex. So we've got a range that goes, you know, all the way up to three litres now. Um, and yep. we started off at 1.6, but I think it's become clear that, that two's your, should be your entry point with Avidex. Okay, um, thanks, Chris. And I think the, the, the last thing about dry seeding that you should be thinking about is that, you know, if all else fails, you've got box of gold early posting weed as a salvage operation. So you should be thinking about, you might have to pull that trigger 
so that if you get the the strategy wrong um, and the rainfall events don't come in and play get, uh, ball with you, that you might actually have to come out and do a salvage operation and you should be prepared to do that. So that's ryegrass. Um, I want to talk briefly about brome grass. Brome grass has turned out to be a, a lot harder to control for us, um, partly because it's a bigger seed and bigger seeded weeds, by and large, pre-emergent herbicides tend to be less effective on. Um, secondly, it's a seed that tends to bury itself. And as my, our discussion about where that herbicide needs to be, um, buried seeds are a lot harder to get with pre most of the pre-emergent herbicides we're using. Um, but the third issue we're having with brome grass is that we're actually selecting for late germinating brome grass. And so this is some uh, uh, Sam Clemens data looking at brome grass uh, collective in the same paddock uh, from in the crop and from on the fence line and when it germinates. And the fence line stuff germinates with that first rain in April. And pretty much you've got all that's going to germinate is germinated by the beginning of May. Um, you know, the brome in the crop has only started thinking about germinating in May and really doesn't get round to it till June. And what this means is that you get the situation where you sow the crop and you find that brome is coming up after you've sown. It's not coming up before, it's not coming up immediately on sowing, but it's coming up sometime after sowing. What's happened, of course, is we've started to lose some of our pre-emergent herbicides. So this makes brome particularly difficult to get with pre-emergent herbicides. Not impossible, but particularly difficult. And I'm going to show another one of these um, box and whiskers plots to just show you how hard it can be to control brome grass with pre-emergent herbicides. So this is the result of a number of trials that we've um, conducted, um, mostly in the Victorian South Australian Mallees. So sandy soils, complicated by non-wetting sands, low rainfall, all of the things that make pre-emergent herbicides harder to work with. And Trifluorin and Metribuzin is a pretty common um, farmer mix, and you pretty much you're really only getting 50% um, control with that. Uh, so, you know, even at the best trials, we're not getting more than about 65% control. And that's what farmers are using. It's cheap, but it's really not doing the job. Even Sakura, which can be really effective under exactly the right conditions on brome, in all of these trials performed pretty poorly. In fact, it was probably worse than trofluor and metribuzin as a rule. So Sakura is not going to be an option. Um, trofluor and stomp, which was another treatment we used, on average was the same as um, trofluor and metribuzin, but tended to perform a little bit more strongly. Um, Sakura plus metribuzin could be better. Um, and the best we had was Sakura plus three litres of Avidex. Now we're talking $75 worth of um, pre-emergent herbicide there, uh, where we could get reasonably good control. But if the rainfall didn't work for us, we could be as low as 30. So I think my message is that even though we can do it, you want to do that with care. You want to use pre-emergent herbicides as your only um, option for brain control with a lot of care because sometimes it's going to come seriously under unstuck and to make it work, you're going to have to spend a lot of money. So if bromes only get out of control, manage it with rotations. Don't try and manage it with chemistry. Uh, I got some photos just to show how these things could work. So trifluorin plus stomp, um, handy early, ran out of puff and a lot of brome came through. Sakura plus avidex could really work. But it's a, it's a, a salvage, think about it as a salvage operation. You know, it's a, if you have a paddy, you absolutely desperately want to have wheat in this year. Um, it's got a brain problem. Well, this is probably the only way you're going to deal with it as a pre-emergent option. Um, so I think we need to be really focused on brome on rotations, managing our break crops. Uh, lastly, just kind of finish off um, just a, a few minutes briefly on herbicide resistant um, issues. And I'm going to talk about South Australia and Victoria because this is where resistance to pre-emergent herbicides is the worst in the country. Um, by and large, trifluralin is still working across Western Australia and New South Wales. There's a little bit of resistance around, but it's not much of a problem. The problem is in South Australia and Victoria, and we've been conducting these um, resistance surveys across the cropping regions over getting on to... Um, uh, 15 years now, and so we've got a, a longitudinal study of what's happening. 
And the way I'm going to present this is present this as the results of the various sets of surveys. So we go back every five years to the same areas and survey and we can see what's happening. So survey one, which we did between 2005 and 2009, we had low levels of trifluorine resistance in Victoria, uh, higher levels in, in um, South Australia, the southeast and the mid north and York Peninsula had the highest levels. So trifluorine are uh, in the blue. In the second lot of surveys, we started testing for resistance to um, trilate and to box of gold from 2013. And what we found there was trifluorine resistance in uh, Western Victoria, so that's Wimmera Mallee, had jumped, um, but it hadn't much changed in the rest of Victoria, but it really started moving in South Australia. Uh, and we were picking up our first examples of um, trilate resistance and our first example of resistance to box of gold. Now, not all the populations that are resistant to trilate become resistant to box of gold, and I'll cover that off in a few minutes. We're getting into our third lot of surveys now. They're going out to 2019, but I've only got data for 2015 and 16. They were surveys in Victoria. Nothing much has changed in northeastern Victoria, and we put down a lot of that to do with the fact that they had they were really uh, badly affected by the millennium drought. Lots of crops were cut for hay during that period, uh, and that's tended to keep resistance lower. But in Western Victoria, we've seen another increase um, in um, trifluorin resistance, and we're starting to pick up trilate resistance in those areas. So what this is telling us is that of all the pre-emergent herbicides we're using, the group J's are the highest risk of resistance. In areas with long history of use, um, trifluorin can start to fail, and that's going to leave us very, very little to work with. Now I want to talk about the absolute worst case of resistance we have. So this is a field population, comes from the Air Peninsula in South Australia, long-term wheat canola rotation. And this population is resistant to trilate. So what I've got here is dose response curves and the rates we've got are in um, their log dose. And so I just want, don't really want to focus too much around the rates yet, but I want you to look at the curves themselves. So with trilate, we, using that alone, we can control ryegrass, these susceptible populations, which are the two on the left in that figure. We can control these populations with the field rate okay. Um, trilate alone is probably not your best choice for ryegrass management. But this resistant population, you know, we're needing more than 10 times the field rate to control it. So trilate doesn't work. That um, population is also resistant to prosulfocarb. And what we see is we see almost the same dose response pattern. So these populations are resistant across the group J herbicides. So none of those herbicides are going to work on these. We're losing them entirely. It gets worse. Populations also resistant to trifluorin. So on the left, we've got trifluorin there. Um, normal use rate that we would use would easily control our susceptibles. Uh, you know, we're looking at um, you know, two litres of trifluorin there in pots with no stubble, controlling this, almost controlling this resistant population. Out in the field, that would be, wouldn't work. I've told you, out in the field, you end up with about half a litre. Um, it's also got some level of resistance to propizomide, though field rates just control it. And it has some resistance, though, to um, Sakura or peroxisulfone, which is the last one of these figures. Though the field rate there, which is 100 grams, we're getting about 75% control. So this is a population where we've lost all of our pre-emergent herbicides. It's resistant to all of this chemistry. This is what it looks like in pots. Um, on the right-hand side, we've got the untreated. At the front, we've got a susceptible. We're running from right to left. Untreated, that's been treated with uh, trilate, treated with box of gold, treated with arcade. So this is a population where we've lost box of gold as well as losing um, trilate, and that's because we've got that group K resistance in there um, as well. So we do have the potential to lose all of our pre-emergent herbicides to resistance, but the big ones we've got to worry about immediately are the group Js followed by the group Ds. So with all of that, 
and to finish off and to be thinking about how we might actually manage our pre-emergent herbicides in our rotation. I've drawn up this sort of um, diagram of the, the main crops that we've got. So wheat, barley, canola and pulses and the sort of modes of action that we've got available. And I've done them by modes of action rather than specific herbicides to try and reduce some of the complexity. So I'll take you through wheat and then we'll cover off on the others. So wheat, we might use trifluralin. Uh, we might mix some Avidex with that. We've got Arcade. We've got Box Gold and we've got Sakura as being our, our main pre-emergent options. And we can do some mixes and matches of those. So we can do Sakura plus Avidex or we can do um, Trofluridum plus um, Sakura, for example. So we've got DJs and Ks for wheat. When we go to barley, again, we've got DJs and Ks, but our only K option is Box of Gold. So really, we've only got Ds and Js in barley. In canola, uh, we can, with triazine um, tolerant canola, we can add Cs to that mix. And we've got Ds, but we've got a different D here and that we've got propizamide. And most of the trifluron resistant um, populations we have are not cross resistant to propizamide, so mostly it works. Um, again, we've got K in the way of butazan. And again, we can do some mixing and matching there. And I'm going to come back to pulses at the end um, and talk about there because we've got a lot more opportunity in pulses. So thinking about this, J's are under threat and we might lose D's. Looking at barley, that'd be all our chemistry. So I'd be thinking about, if I was going to look at this, I'd be thinking about, well, we want to kind of try and concentrate J's in the barley phase. And so perhaps keep J's out of some of the other phases, particularly out of, say, the pulse phase um, and out of canola and try and focus on the barley phase with um, with the group J chemistry. And you'd probably be wanting to mix that. So you might look at a, you know, trifluridin um, with uh, arcade or, or some other mixture around there. In wheat, if we're gonna say we're gonna try and concentrate the J's in the barley, uh, these are under a bit of threat, wheat's gonna be our spot for K's. So we wanna try and concentrate the K's in wheat. And so I'd be looking at going, well, you know, Sakura is going to be our best product most years, possibly not this year, depending on what the rainfall does. Um, but Sakura is going to be a, a main product we should always be thinking about for wheat. And again, we might mix and match that, um, say, with trifluridin or with, with something else um, so that we can then leave our J's freer for barley. With canola, we probably want to be then focusing mainly on the C's and D's. So propizamide is going to be a key product for us. Uh, if we're growing um, triazine tolerant canola, we might be mixing and matching that with some group Cs. Uh, we might use a little bit of group uh, uh, J and K in there if we have to uh, for particular purposes. And when we come to the pulses, we probably should be trying to get away from Js and Ks completely in the pulses because we've got more options around the C and D space. And in some of the pulses, we also have the opportunity of terrain, which is a group G, and that's the one in brackets. But then we're going to have to mix and match that group G with some other things. So we might be thinking of adding simazine to that, or we might be thinking of, um, of uh, propizamide um, with that, or some other uh, option around that, um, around that pulse phase. So the pulses we have the most options in, and that's where we've got the most chance to take our high risk products out. Barley, we have the least options. And so that's probably where we should be focusing our high risk products because we don't have other choices in barley. Of course, if you don't grow barley, that leaves those products free as, say, to use in wheat and take some of the pressure off the case in wheat, for example. So that's how I'd be thinking about doing that sort of uh, mix and match um, option. And I'd be looking that we should be trying to avoid using any one of these modes of action more than twice in four years so that we get that rotation component in there. So not necessarily having to rotate every year, but making sure that we're not overusing any one of those um, pre-emergent modes of action. So I know I'm kind of running up time there, Peter, but I thought that'd be where I'd finish. And uh, I'm sure you've got a few more questions. Yeah, fantastic, Chris. Yeah, we do have some questions and I mean, uh Someone did ask a question a bit earlier, which we'll cover now, which was around the question of if we go Avidex Sakura, 
uh, is there a risk of cross resistance between them? And then you've gone on to sort of show where there was a little bit of cross resistance between Abidex and Box of Gold, I think, and then another population, Trofluralin, with some cross resistance to Sakura. Um, and also, well, for the first time, I've, I hadn't seen the Trofluralin and a bit of extra resistance to Propizamide. So, um, yeah, just, I guess, some comments around all of that. I'll just keep going for a second, Chris. I mean, Roberto Buzzi did the work in the lab, found that cross-resistance between all of them, except for propizamide, uh, and then you're starting to see some field populations now with some of these cross-resistances. So I guess that's probably, look, it's an open-ended question. I'll let you have a swing at it how you like. So that particular population I was talking about, it doesn't have cross-resistance between the J's and K's. Um, in right. fact, the, the mechanism in that population that gets resistance to the J's can't give resistance to the K's. So that cross-resistance to the K's has come from somewhere else. We're right. not entirely sure where it's come from, uh, but it might be from either a, a propizamide or possibly trifluralin. Um, and part of the trouble with some of these field populations is they do get long and complex histories, but that particular population would have received very little K chemistry. It's mainly received Ds and Js um, over the years because of weak canola rotation, um, trifluralin or trifluralin avidex, and then box of gold in the wheat phase. And in the canola phase, it was, it was largely propizamide. Um, so it's had a lot of Ds and Js, not very much in the mm. way of Ks. So certainly, yeah, cross resistance is a worry to us. And worldwide, wherever we've seen resistance to the group Ks, it's come largely because of cross resistance. Uh, we don't have too many examples of Ks necessarily selecting for resistance. Of course, with ryegrass, everything's possible, so I won't say that won't happen, but we do have to worry about cross resistance. Um, so in this case, um, that particular population is not from the Jays, but it's probably from somewhere else. That doesn't mean that we're not going to have other populations where um, it is from the Jays, but most of the trifluralin resistant populations we've had a look at in the initial, I beg pardon, most of the trilate populations we had a look at, at least in the initial phase, box of gold worked on. We're mm. now picking up ones that box of gold's not working on. So whether we got two different things happening there, and so we've had these series that, have got one mechanism and then we've got another lot that have got a different mechanism or whether we've got some other issue coming up, we don't quite know. Um, time will tell. We're actively trying to understand where that group K um, resistance has come from so that we can have a bit of an idea of what that rotation really should look like. Yeah, I mean, it is tricky to be too prescriptive, isn't it? Because we have, like I say, Roberto's lab work, but only limited field populations now um, and we're trying to make the best recommendations with all of that. So, um, yeah, so it is it is tricky to be perfect, uh, perfectly specific and have the perfect herbicide rotation, isn't it? Well, I think it's impossible because of the of the nature of the, the different patterns of cross resistance we see. So if we've got, yeah. if we've got D plus K cross resistance along with J plus K cross resistance and, you know, the, how do we ro mix and rotate our herbicides amongst that? sort of pattern if you don't know what cross resistance you're going to get. So yeah, I, think the, I think the, mm. think the strategy is to, is to take a broad approach that deals with all of these resistance, potential resistance problems together. And that's kind of what I've tried to put here, a, a bit of thinking about, well, there's lots of rotations you can choose, but pick a set of rotations, but try not to use each mode of action too often. But make sure yeah. that you're where you, where you need to, you're mixing, and um, you're definitely rotating. Yeah, I guess a little bit further to that, Michelle Owen with her recent Western Australian random survey uh, found I think 11% of the populations with some level of resistance to box of gold, yet we haven't used that much box of gold in Western Australia, so we strongly suspect that it is a, a cross resistance showing up. So, yeah, um, look, it is a... Uh, I think you've summarised it very well, Chris. We won't go on about it too much longer, but um, yeah, I guess that's where we are thinking with the with the research at the moment, isn't it? Is is to just keep ahead of it as much as we can and and keep um, coming up with the best recommendations with the science that we have at the time. 
Yeah, so that's what, what we're trying to understand where this group K resistance has come from so we can provide some better advice about what mixtures are most useful. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, a couple of other questions from other listeners. Uh, this one's quite specific. Uh, is prosulfur carb generally quite weak on brome? Uh, prosulfur carb generally has very low activity on brome, um, so we just don't include it in, our, in our, any of our trials because we never get enough control. Yeah, okay. Um, another one, I mean, it probably goes outside of labels, but someone's asked a question, what about very high rates of herbicide, for example, five litres of trifluralin in canola? Um, I'm not sure what the upper label registration of trifluralin in canola, I'm guessing it's around the three litres. But, I think it's um, three from memory. Yeah, but uh, what are your thoughts about, you know, going oh. to that, that maximum label rate in trifluralin resistant populations? Yeah, look, one of the things that we did, um, you know, in terms of managing trifluralin resistance when it first happened in South Australia, you know, there were there were strategies to you know, lift the rate of trifluralin at Avidex. And, you know, that was that was certainly effective. Um, one of the things you have to worry about lifting your rate of trifluralin is that it becomes, well, in canola, you're a bit safer, but in cereals, it becomes much more damaging on light soils. So you've got an upper limit to what you can go to. Um, but we certainly, you know, have people moving from one and a half to two and two and a half um, and getting a level of control of their ryegrass. And just because you have some resistance doesn't necessarily mean that you can't ever use that herbicide again. One of the things you'd have noticed from those dose response curves I showed is that all this pre-emergent herbicide resistance is rate responsive. And that means that we can get control of some of that with either mixtures or by going up to the top of the label. So, you know, higher rates of trifluralin uh, in canola to deal with some trifluralin resistance, that's fine. But eventually we got to the point where our trifluralin resistant ryegrass wouldn't respond to three litres. And at that yeah, point, okay. you know, you've got, you've got to give it away. You've got to do something else. But I would say that if you're thinking about lifting the rates, also think about adding the Avidex to it. Okay. All right. Well, a little bit further to that, Chris, someone else has sort of put in a question about um, factor uh, and saying that, you know, factor isn't enough. And I know that some people are using, you know, factor clethidim mixes at the full, full rates and finding that's not enough and we are at the limit of our label. Um, and so I guess the question is, is there uh, any chance or any talk about doing more MRL and toxicity sort of work to up the um, the dim rates that we can use in some of our pulses where we do have crop safety or um, or do you think that we are at our sort of maximum label rates now and that work is unlikely to happen? Uh, uh, my guess is my guess is we're you know we're probably at the maximum label and um, there would be a number of reasons why further work is unlikely, one of which is the return on investment, you know, for a pulse label is pretty low. Um, mm. But secondly, um, it's about international um, trade and MRL requirements for international trade and whether we'd actually get into that uh, breaching those um, territory if we lifted the rates. One of the things about factor, and I think that, you know, people who are trying to use it really need to understand is the factor is really good on two to three leaf ryegrass and quickly falls away in terms of its efficacy. And part of the trouble we've had is that we've developed this situation where we try and put our clethidium out as late as possible to get as much ryegrass as possible. And when we're adding factor to it, the later we go, the less effective that factor becomes. In fact, we've shown that the uh, um, clethidium itself becomes less effective on clethidium resistant ryegrass, the bigger the ryegrass. So, our way of managing this is to try and put the clethidine factor treatment out early in the crop and then if we've got to go again, you know, we might go with a bit more um, clethidine on its own later and uh, and do it that way rather than trying to push the friendship around factor. So factor, try and stick to two to three leaf ryegrass if you can, you'll get the best out of it. I don't think we're going to see a lot of label movement in that space. Righto. Thanks, Chris. Look, uh, we probably do need to wrap it up there, everyone. Um, we have gone a few minutes over time. Um, so, yeah, thanks very much, Chris. You, you covered a, a lot of ground as, as usual and um, 
and as you've sort of alluded to, it is a bit of a moving feast with the um, with the science on the on the mixes and uh, pre-em herbicide rotation options that we have, and so there is more science coming there. So. Um, look, I'll just uh, finish off by saying thanks very much, Chris, for, um, yeah, once again, very informative webinar. And uh, those of you that have listened, you can, if there's something you want to go back over, you can go back and have a look at the recording a bit later. So thanks very much, Chris. Thank you. And just everyone, as you sign off, thanks again for listening in. And this, week, this Weed Smart webinar series, just a reminder, as I mentioned earlier on, Weed Smart Week, on in the north out of Narrabri, save the date, 20th of August, there'll be a day of seminars, a couple of days of great field trips, a lot of farmers talking to farmers, as well as uh, information for agronomists and so on as well. Uh, as I said also, Mark Congreve's webinar from earlier in the week is now up on the website and this, web, this recording will go up this afternoon. So thanks everyone and have a great day and we'll see you next time.